Welcome to Maine Quality. I'm your host, Orion Breen, and with us today is Hannah Pingree, who is the director of the future. How are you doing, Hannah? Good. It's, it's, it's the, the future is uncertain, so it's good to be here. So you work with the governor's office of innovation, and give us your title, because it's, it's, it's more than just director of the future. It's a mouthful, yes. So I, I help manage the governor's office uh, of policy, innovation, and the future. And so uh, we really work closely with Governor Mills on issues that are long-term, that are about the future, that require cre creativity, people work, working across state government. Um, she hates the silos, um, so it's been an exciting job, but certainly a job that has changed in the last couple months. Well, it sounds like it's almost something you, you don't ask, well, what do, they, what do you do? It's what do you don't do? Uh, policy in the future. I mean, hopefully every department and everything we're working on is looking at innovation in the future. I mean, I think that's a, that's a great way to do it. Um, we do try to focus a little bit on the key areas um, of priority for the governor. I would say our most significant project is, is around climate and energy. So we manage the governor's climate council. Um, clearly, the issues of climate change, uh, the energy mix for the state has a lot of opportunity, a lot of innovation involved. Um, but also really important. Um, the other areas we manage are the children's cabinet, so having state agencies work across state government and around the state on improving the lives of kids. Um, we work a lot on economic development issues. Um, we're currently managing the Governor's Economic Recovery Committee um, with a number of private sector stakeholders. Um, so clearly the economy is important. Important, we work a lot with um, Maine's Department of Economic and Community Development. Um, and lastly, but certainly not least, um, Gordon Smith sits in our office who works on opioid response. Again, an issue of huge priority for the governor and an area where really bringing people across state agencies is important. Um, obviously, it's a challenging issue, an issue that's become a little more difficult during this pandemic, but, but important. So what would you like to dive into first? We're working on both pandemic COVID response, but also um, whether it's the economy or climate change, those are really our kind of two big areas taking up my brain. So whatever you want to start with. Let's get into pandemic response, since obviously that's top of mind for everybody, and that's affecting all the other stuff you're working on as well. What do you want folks to understand about what's happening at the governor's office and specifically what, what you're involved in when it comes to the response to the pandemic? So that's a it's a great question. I mean, I think obviously it's been an all hands on deck situation for for the governor and her commissioners and my office. Um, I think we all um, we we went home from state government on March 16th. Everyone's been working remotely for the most part with few folks in the governor's office, um, but we've really been all been pitching in across the board. Um, my office has been uh, supporting, you know, staying in touch with the municipalities and nonprofits. Um, sort of understanding what's happening on the ground, the kinds of urgent areas of help that people need. Um, we're coordinating the governor's economic recovery committee. Um, the governor appointed that group in mid-May, just seeing that this pandemic is really wreaking havoc on our economy, on nonprofit sectors, um, on you know a lot of the, the ways that people both work and, and the companies they run. So she has asked uh, a group of um, private citizens to give her the best advice to kind of urgently stabilize the economy, but also figure out how to get Maine back on a path to economic growth. Um, we're in the urgently stabilized phase right now, um, but clearly this work is incredibly important and it's taken us into issues of, you know, schools and what happens to our kids and childcare centers, both for the sake of kids' lives, but also their parents and, and trying to get back to work. Um, we're focused on clearly the hospitality and business sector is, is concerned and, and asking for help. Um, but also issues of housing and immigrants um, and, you know, just people's day-to-day -day lives being significantly disrupted. So the mission of our office is to try to bring people together across state government and in other sectors of the state. And we've certainly um, been as busy as we've ever been, primarily on Zoom, um, but really just trying to pitch in um, on behalf of the governor. I mean, clearly, she's taken this public health crisis very seriously tried to take um, you know aggressive steps to protect Maine people but also keep the economy going um, in, in all the ways that we possibly can so it's certainly been a balance um, there's a lot of opinions but also been a lot of support for 
Um, we're seeing right now what's happening in other parts of the U.S. where where the pandemic has really shifted into a more difficult phase. So uh, right now the numbers are looking better in Maine, but we're constantly on guard for you know how to how to make sure Maine people are are safe. What have you seen innovative wise of how different industries and sectors have innovated to address the pandemic, be it remote learning for education or accessing healthcare through technology? I think the, both are, are great examples. I mean, clearly this, this pandemic has sort of changed the context of all of our lives and, and business operations, schools, uh, healthcare, you know, we all sort of had to shift on a dime and some of that was pretty bumpy, but certainly there's been uh, probably some positive innovation, understanding that remote work is more manageable than people thought, at least to some degree. Um, certainly the state workforce is, you know, shifted almost 90% of people working remotely where possible. So um, I think that we've had some learning for, for the state, certainly had learning in the healthcare system that, you know, having people drive long distances for short check-in appointments with their doctor, it's a waste of fuel and time and, and, and it's possible to do on the internet if we have access to high-speed internet. Um, I would say we've, we've clearly understood the challenges of Maine's high-speed internet connections and where people don't have it, they're really being left behind. So that's been a pretty big area of focus for the governor and certainly a focus of the economic work. Um, I would say we've seen, you know, we've seen innovation in, in every industry. I mean, the transportation, I mean, the um, tourism sector, uh, restaurants, you know, they shifted to creative ways to serve their customers in safe ways. Um, I mean, clearly they're still struggling, but that some of that work has been um, exciting and important. I'd say probably most excitingly is seeing the number of businesses who really want to help um, make a difference in this pandemic. You know, folks like IDEX, incredibly important, innovative company in Maine, um, completely shifting so much of their operations to how do we help Maine with the testing challenges. Um, and they've stepped up in a big, big way to provide um, a lot of the sort of backbone of Maine's um, increased testing for, for COVID. And that's really what's going to allow um, sort of, it's an important part of public health and getting us back to safe operations. Uh, we've seen companies, you know, lots of companies, L.L. Bean, uh, American Roots, saying we're going to make masks. There's 10 or 15 companies in Maine making masks. Um, I mean, clearly Puritan and others have, have really stepped it up. So you know, while there's been incredibly challenging economic dislocation, there's also been some exciting bright spots. So um, I think it's very uh, similar to sort of what we know in Maine is we're pretty scrappy and creative and people are going to do their very best to make it work. Um, but obviously, despite that innovation, there's still a lot of challenges. Some of the rules of how healthcare and how government and bureaucracies have operated have been tweaked during while we're in this emergency. Do you think yeah. some of the ways that we've tweaked things to make it more accessible and more digital and technology friendly will remain after the pandemic? I mean, I certainly think so. I think in both state government and the private sector. Um, I mean, from restaurants who've had to figure out online ordering in a hurry to do takeout to state government, how to, you know, better allow people to access, you know, hearings or services online. Um, I mean, I have a weekly phone call with uh, municipal and mayors and, and they're already requesting how do we make sure people can continue to access public meetings via online um, because, you know, they've actually seen increases in participation um, in their public boards and meetings and town meetings um, when people are able to participate remotely. So I think there have been certainly good learnings in how to make things more accessible. Um, we are undertaking a major project with our Maine Climate Council in public engagement. And we planned uh, actually this spring in April, a whole series of large public meetings. Those obviously could not go forward. And so we've shifted that process online and so I think it actually makes it more convenient for working folks, people with kids, people with busy lives to participate. Um, you know that being said we still have 80,000 plus people in Maine not on the internet so making sure those people get connected so as the world becomes more um, internet friendly that we don't leave further leave behind those people who, who really have a stake in the process and, and need to be able to participate as the rest of us are. Would you like to uh, give a shout out to any of the bond issues? 
Well, there's just, there's only two of them, and they're both really important. I would say. Uh, I, I can't imagine there are many Mainers um, who don't agree with the need for continued improvement of high-speed internet access. So the $15 million bond um, around the internet, I, I certainly would, would hope Mainers would support. There's also an $85 million bond around transportation infrastructure. And um, while we're not driving as much, I think we all know that our roads and bridges as well as you know, ports, culverts, they all need to be upgraded. Um, it's an important part of really building a sort of backbone of our economy. So both are important, both need you know, far beyond what's even on the ballot right now. So um, I hope people will get out. I hope a lot of people already voted um, absentee, um, but the, the Tuesday election is, is key. And I think these two funding priorities will, will help. They'll be sort of the beginning of important work. I would also say that I know that, you know, a lot of our elections have been run by the hardcore volunteers of our state, who many of whom are older. I mean, the people in my town who count the ballots and sit at the polls are, are usually retired. And so there's been a big push to get younger people to volunteer, to sit at the polls, to help count ballots. Um, there usually are, is a need for uh, volunteers from both parties and independents. So I, I would encourage uh, younger people to consider doing that as their civic duty, because there's still gonna be a lot of people out voting on election day, um, especially in November, it's an important election. So, um, well, that's, that's not my job, but I would certainly promote the engagement of younger people as sort of getting involved in their communities in ways um, that are needed right now. So speaking of one of your jobs, I believe you're, you're one of the heads of the Maine Climate Council. Yes, so, I mean, as I said, one of the, kind of key issues for the governor has been tackling climate change. I think it's an issue which she ran on, she feels is incredibly important to take seriously. Uh, she was the only governor invited to the UN this past fall, um, and she spoke to the UN about um, Maine's commitment to tackling climate change. I think probably your listeners don't need to be convinced, but you know, from our warming ocean to our forests to our you know challenges of sea level rise, Maine is gonna be is an incredibly climate impacted state. So um, I co-chair the Maine Climate Council with Jerry Reed, um, the commissioner of uh, the Department of Environmental Protection. And our job is really to work with a group of 39 Climate Council members. Um, we have six working groups, which have nearly 250 people involved. Um, and we are trying to put together uh, a four-year action plan by December 1 of, of how Maine should be tackling climate change. So the sort of two big parts of that are one, how do we reduce our uh, carbon emissions um, so that we can meet the goals the state has set out, which is a 45% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 and more than 80% um, by 2050. So, and then the other side is how do we um, make Maine more resilient? How do we adapt and prepare our state, um, our industries, our communities, our people, for some of the impacts of climate we know are gonna come and are here, um, regardless of our ability to reduce carbon emissions. So I think it's an issue that's widely supported by Maine people. Uh, we have support from business and labor unions and young people, the tribes, there's lots of people engaged in the Climate Council's work. Um, and we're actually, uh, very convenient, you, you got me on your show right now, just launched a project uh, via our website. So it's Climate Council, .maine.gov is our website, and we are asking Maine people to give us their opinions um, on some of the draft strategies that have come out of the working groups. Um, there's a lot there, and so people can kind of do it in bite size. If you're interested in how we make our buildings more efficient, what do we do with our transportation system, uh, what should we do on the coast, um, there's kind of targeted sections about each of those areas. Um, so we love people's thoughts and input, but obviously, it's an important issue. It's a it's a big one for the governor, and it's certainly one that I, I personally feel strongly about as well. So it's exciting work, and it's crucial. You have different subcommittee groups who are focused on different areas from emergency response to transportation and energy. What are the different groups, and what are some of the highlights of those presentations of how we each sector is going to try and uh, address this important issue? It's a big question because it's a really expansive issue. Um, so the Climate Council has six working groups and then a science and technical committee. So our science committee really kind of led because 
We think science is important when you're talking about an issue of climate change. Science and data needs to be to be accurate and, and really kind of leading the charge. So then the six working groups, um, three of them are on the mitigation side. So how do we reduce carbon emissions? That's kind of their primary focus. Uh, transportation, buildings, housing and infrastructure, and energy. So I'd say those three groups really were a lot about how do we make Maine's energy sector um, much more renewable. Um, Maine has already passed a renewable uh, standard which requires that 80% of the electricity in Maine be renewable by 2030. So that kind of leads the charge. So we make Maine's electricity sector much cleaner. And then we, um, I would say a lot of the, the proposals are around how do we then electrify transportation and buildings to take advantage of that clean energy. Um, it's not, that's, those are certainly not the only things, like how do we help Mainers weatherize their homes um, so they are more efficient? Um, how do we reduce the amount of miles people have to travel with increased internet, um, improved internet, um, you know, better uh, land use um, incentives so that people build more walkable downtowns, um, increase public transportation systems where possible. I mean, Maine is a very rural state, but there are even small scale um, transportation options that help people get around. There are many more recommendations, so I haven't done them full justice, but that's kind of the areas of major focus uh, on reducing emissions. And then on the other side, um, we have a natural and working lands group, a coastal and marine group, and then the super group, which is such a mouthful, I can't get it all out, but really important, about community resiliency, which is about planning, emergency management, and public health. And so those three groups kind of had a, a big task of how do we prepare industries, um, communities, and you know, public health and emergency management systems for changes we know that will come from climate. So a lot of that is how do we arm communities with tools and incentives to, to prepare, whether it's you know, moving wastewater treatment plants to what do we do with road systems, um, how do we improve our public health infrastructure, um, how do we get our fisheries ready for changes we know are gonna come and, and keep the communities viable that rely on those fisheries. I'd say natural and working lands is a, is a big group that has both, you know, Maine is 90% forested. So we have a lot of trees that are taking up carbon, which is great for our state. And we wanna be able to preserve that, um, keep our forests working in a way, but also figure out ways to even incentivize um, more of that sequestration. Um, that group also, you know, has has a lot of farmers in the mix. So how do we support um, agriculture that will both reduce how far our food needs to travel, improve um, improve soil soils in Maine and their abilities to sequester carbon, um, also protect our wildlife in our state through conservation programs. So there's a lot in the Climate Council report, more than I could talk for three hours and really bore you all about it. But I would again highly recommend you go to our website. Um, climatecouncil.maine.gov kind of has bite-sized um, information about each of the six working groups. You can also read each of their many, many page reports they just came out with if you're a real climate geek and want to dive into it. Um, and then again, we're, we're really asking for people's opinions. Um, people can give us their overall opinions about climate and how it's impacting their lives, or they can give us specific thoughts on the recommendations um, that again, we just heard about um, in this past month. Um, the Climate Council will be really thinking about all those recommendations, figuring out how to fold them together. Uh, we meet again in September, and between September and November, we need to make decisions about how to prioritize the recommendations. Um, so it's important work, but it's also work that is really key that Maine people know about, um, are engaged, and also give us their opinions. So um, log on and, and tell us what you think. I recently had uh, Julie Rosenbach of South Portland and Troy Moon of Portland Sustainability Directors talking about their One Climate Future Plan. How is the Maine Climate Council working with towns to put put some of these ideas in action on, on the ground level, on the local level? Well, I mean, you talked to two good folks. I mean, Portland and South Portland are really leading the charge. Um, Julie is was on one of our working groups and Troy's been um, really helpful in a lot of different ways. I mean, I would say it kind of goes both ways. Cities and towns need state leadership to enact, um, to sort of make possible um, some of the things that they're trying to make happen. I mean, the, the state getting to much more uh, clean energy mix is really about state level policy decisions and, and leadership. 
Um, and at the same time, I think we really rely on the creativity um, of of our people, our businesses and cities and towns to make a lot of this stuff happen. So I would say there's gonna be a lot coming out of the Climate Council about how do we better support efforts at the local level? How do we help those folks who are doing the hard work, um, you know, do it even better in both, you know, local context, regional context. Um, I would say, um, I think, you know, we've already seen a ton of examples, you know, kids, really lobbying to put solar on their schools, fishermen's co-op investing in re renewable energy, um, lots of municipal renewable energy projects. So, you know, we call these like lead by example. And I think the more of it that happens, the more people realize these kind of projects are good for the climate. They also save taxpayers money. Um, I think that they will continue to be the way of the future. So uh, again, Troy and Julie have done a great job leading the charge. And I think, you know, we really see towns and cities as partners. You talked about um, opioids right now with the pandemic, you know, people are isolated and it's, it seems like it's even a, a more challenging time to work through recovery and, and get people the care and resources they need. What's, what's happening on the opioid level? I would highly encourage you to invite Gordon Smith on your show at some point. He's the, the governor's director of opioid response who I work with on a regular basis, he sits in our office. Um, he has actually a big summit coming up later this month. I think it's uh, July 22nd or 23rd. Um, that's gonna be virtual, but we'd love as many people to be engaged in that as possible. Um, I mean, I think the reality is that Maine has taken a proactive approach, really um, talking openly about the importance of recovery and supporting recovery. Um, and I think that has helped. Um, but I would also say this, this period of, pandemic has been incredibly challenging for many, many people, you know, from young people um, to, you know, we've certainly watched the state suicide rates, and I think it is also showing up in the opioid crisis. Um, I think we have seen uh, across New England an increase in opioid deaths, and um, I think we all have unfortunately continued to sort of worry about this in our communities. So I, I would say um, there's not an easy answer. I think the the continued focus on the part of state government, but also communities and healthcare systems and everywhere else is important. And um, again, it requires probably the continued focus of mental health support, addiction uh, funding, um, but also just being really um, open about how challenging a situation it is and how important it is to support people. You know, the pandemic has changed everybody's what they're working on and what they're focusing on. If knock on wood a year from now, we've, we've overcome some of the biggest hurdles of this pandemic and things are starting to turn back to normal. Where do you see yourself and the work you're doing in a year from now? What would you like to be focusing on? Well, I, I, mean, I certainly hope a year from now we are there, but it's, it's hard to, even though I'm in the office of the future, it's very hard to predict the future right now. I think we're all kind of struggling with this uh, the level of uncertainty um, in the future of kind of whether our kids are going back to school, what the economy looks like, um, everything else. I, I think I would say um, in a year, I, um, I think the two issues that I get to work on that are most exciting are, are really um, creatively and proactively um, working on climate and energy and also the future of the main economy. And I think even those issues are linked. I think um, Maine has a lot of opportunity when it comes to building a more sustainable economy. Um, I think about rural Maine jobs in the forest product sector. Um, you know, we're trying to support a, a, a wood um, insulation plant in Madison, Maine that could produce good paying jobs, use, use Maine forest products, um, but also produce an incredibly climate friendly um, product, something that makes our homes more efficient. So I think there are a lot of wins like that in Maine, in, in, again, in renewable energy, in the ocean sector, um, you know, just the work of, of doing infrastructure work in our towns puts people to work and it makes us more resilient. So I grew up in Maine like you did. It's, it's a great state. It's a state that um, I think we know needs to continue to grow and evolve and, and be as welcoming as possible to new people because um, you know, before this, we were all work, we were all focused on workforce and and growing Maine's workforce sector just to support our long-term economy. And I think those issues are just as important. I think, you know, honestly, I think everything in the future is going to be 
impacted by this pandemic. I think we see the world in a different way. We all kind of, at least I know I personally kind of value how beautiful a state Maine is, how lucky, lucky we are to live in a place like this. And I think um, certainly some of my friends and family who live in big cities are starting to see that as well. And I actually think we will see Maine's economy um, and population grow um, kind of in the short and long-term future. And I think that's an opportunity for Maine. So all the issues I love to work on, I think are, are well-timed for this period. I think there's hard work, but really important work to be done. And the kind of work I think a lot of people in Maine believe in, you know, we need to make sustainable communities. Um, we need to make as many good paying jobs um, to support our population. And I think that will really kind of bolster our state for the future because Maine's a great state. I think um, we all know that. And I think more and more people are finding it out. So that being said, if they all move here, we need to manage that really carefully. So that would be a future challenge. How did you get started in this work? I ran for the legislature when I was 24 years old and um, won my election from like running from the offshore island that I'm living on right now. So I moved home from New York City. I was working for an internet company, um, moved back to work. Actually, uh, my mom was running for, for higher office. Um, so really, I think that got me started of just how important it is to be involved, that you can make a difference in state government. Um, I've taken breaks from that. I was term limited from the legislature when I was uh, 32 years old. I have a couple of kids now that are getting a little bit bigger. And um, so I had served in the legislature with the governor and, and she um, asked me to come back and, and take on this challenge. So it's a great job. It's really important work. Despite the kind of dark period we're all living through, um, I, I really think that Maine has a lot of potential. So it's the most exciting thing I think I, I think I could be doing. Why do you live in Maine? What makes Maine special to you? Well, we all, I, I grew up here. So uh, we got sucked in and then we tried to leave and then we got sucked back in. So um, again, I think, you know, I have a, a seven and a nine year old. I think it's, um, a great place to raise kids. It's, you know, among the most beautiful places in the world. I live in Maine and I love Maine because it has um, so much value. I mean, we have, I think, great people in wonderful communities. I think there's always work that can be done. You know, we're living through an important period of really starting to talk more seriously about racial equity issues. And I think that's an area where Maine uh, needs to continue to focus to be as welcoming as possible. Again, it's a great state that could be made better. So I'm happy to be here, happy to be living in a, a very rural town, but getting to work on, on a lot of issues um, that are diverse across our state. What do you think are the biggest challenges or opportunities in the state? We have both. <laughs> I think our biggest challenges are how do we be more welcoming? How do we create a sort of state infrastructure that is more kind of a growth mindset is, is, is a challenge. I mean, we all live in small towns and we don't like change. Um, I think how do we manage change as a state carefully and in a way that really is future looking? Um, again, back to issues of economic growth, of, of kind of managing incredibly complicated but important issues like climate. I think those are, are really key to our future. I think they are both our challenges and our opportunities. Um, I think we have huge opportunity to take, you know, traditional natural resource sectors and take them to the next level, um, you know, in the fisheries, in the forest product sector, in our farming. Um, I think we have so much um, in terms of natural resources, and we have very traditionally kind of allowed those products to leave Maine without a lot of value. Um, we have more and more innovative companies that are, that are starting. Um, but I think we need to really figure out how to accelerate them and take them to the next level because I think they are the future of the main economy. A lot of them are, are really kind of speak well to the climate challenges we're facing. Um, and they are the kinds of companies and jobs that the whole world is going to be looking to in the coming years, whether it's, again, renewable energy or sustainable food products. So I think Maine has everything it takes, but how do we really make these things um, kind of happen at higher and bigger levels. Um, again, we're a very small business oriented state and small businesses are tremendous and important, um, but it's also important to kind of really focus on some of those sectors that, you know, a wood products factory making insulation is gonna be a slightly larger company. It's gonna take some risks. It's gonna take some neighbors who agree with the, the hope and the promise. And so I think, you know, I think that work is important, and I think I think Mainers need to understand that roadmap, um, and that kind of communication challenge is something that I think 
state government, but also business and community leaders all kind of need to collaborate on um, how we how we together kind of convince Mainers of, of the, about that future. Who inspires you in Maine and beyond? Right now, I'm working very closely with uh, Josh Broder um, of Tilson Technologies and Lori Lachance, the head of Thomas College. Um, the two of them are uh, co-chairing the Governor's Economic Recovery Committee, and I think they really represent um, really important and exciting leaders of Maine who kind of see this same approach of Maine has a lot to offer, but we need to really uh, move forward more aggressively. Um, so they inspire me. I'm incredibly inspired by this governor who I work for, who um, she's super tough and and yet really kind of a down to earth person. Um, I think she's really stepped up in this pandemic period um, to just make really hard decisions that weren't always popular, but that were really important. Um, I think have really shown to be many of the right decisions um, in this pandemic period. I would say I work closely with Jean Lambrew um, and Dr. Shaw, and you know, Dr. Shaw has got celebrity status right now in Maine, but I think the two of them, um, as well as Heather Johnson, are just doing such hard and kind of important work. I think a lot of people, um, there are many people across state government who are kind of laboring away in really hard ways and doing hard work. They are inspiring me. Um, poor Jean Lambrew literally works every weekend you know, trying to figure out how to expand testing capacity and contact tracing and all these things that we all care about. So I think, um, again, I'm inspired by people who just have stepped up so significantly um, in this time period. We've expanded capabilities of testing at CDC and we bought some new equipment. When we get past this pandemic, how do we leverage those investments and resources we made into tackling other issues? I am not a biotech expert. I mean, Maine actually has a pretty um, exciting uh, biotech sector and, you know, again, led by JAX and IDEX um, and a lot of these companies that are so engaged in our pandemic response. Um, I mean, I would say, again, those two companies are, are, are key. Um, you know, IDEX is really the state's key partner on ramping up our testing capacity. Um, and yet they're a company that doesn't even deal with human health. I mean, they're, they're a totally different sector dealing mostly with animals. So I don't know like whether the lab, the state lab, you know, what mode that will shift into, I think. Um, but I would just say more big picture, this kind of investment in public health and technology and kind of figuring out how to um, do more creative and innovative things quickly in partnership with the private sector will, will certainly yield long-term gains in other areas. Um, I, I mean, again, I just would say a company like IDEX has already been an important one for Maine, and I think their kind of um, ability to step up uh, during this crisis will, will, I'm sure, allow them to really shift in bigger ways in the future as well. Um, I can't predict how or where, but I would say that, that, again, that sector is a big one growing, especially in Southern Maine. It has a lot of promise. Those are good jobs for Maine, um, and I think the state's partnership with those um, organizations, again, on issues maybe of climate, um, of other research and development that's important to the state, um, there's, there's a lot of promise there. Is there anything we haven't touched on that you'd like to say a few words about? The only thing I would guess I would say is I think in, in this pandemic period is people really have stepped up in, in such crucial and hard ways. And I think we just, in state government, we really do recognize you know, what working parents are dealing with, you know, the challenges of laid off workers. I mean, there's a lot of hard stuff happening right now. So, you know, while I have optimism for Maine's future still and, and hope, I think we are really slogging and our economy is struggling. Oh, you know, thousands of people have lost their jobs. You know, they're now near a cliff of potentially losing unemployment benefits. So I think it's, some things are only to get more hard over the next couple months. And I think it's just, you know, really important that all of us um, and certainly that's what my office and the governor is thinking about all the time is, you know, how do we, how do we try to help, you know, in, in the limited ways that state government can, because it's going to be, it's going to, it's a difficult period. It's certainly unprecedented. I think we, none of us understand the kind of um, how the long-term nature of the, of the economic damage. And so I think it's just, um, it's important to recognize that it's uncharted territory. It's going to be really difficult. Um, but it's also important that, you know, as we, we as Mainers continue to figure out how to be supportive and, and 
kind to each other um, because I, I think there's just, you know, nationally we're just seeing an incredibly kind of divisive situation and that's not usually where Maine goes and I, I hope that we continue to avoid that. How do you stay hopeful and grounded in this challenging time? Luckily I'm so busy just trying to keep things moving forward and, and be supportive on a bunch of different fronts. Again, you know, we're working on economic recovery. We're supporting some public health work. We work on climate change. So uh, it's, I think I just stay busy and sort of figure out as long as we got to keep moving, pushing these rocks up a hill because, you know, we're, we're the ones who are here to do it. And so, um, you know, I stay hopeful in that I think a lot of good people are committed and working on all of these issues and, and doing the very best they can. So um, that's how I stay hopeful. Certainly hope the federal government will step up and help us on a few of them in the coming months and years. Um, but I think, you know, just keep doing the work, at least that, that you know, I know that I'm doing all that I can and, and I know thousands of other people are doing the same. You're listening to Maine Quality. I'm your host, Orion Breen, and with me today is Hannah Pingree, Director of the Governor's Office of Innovation and the Future. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me.